And this is the session that I know everybody waits for every year, the great debate. We're going to de be debating whether long-acting injectable ART will solve adolescent ART problems. And Dr. Tanawi Putan Putanakit, I never get your name right, I'm sorry. Uh, professor uh, and Pediatric Infectious Disease Specialist of the Department of Pediatrics in Chula Longhorn University in Bangkok, Thailand, um, will be pro. And Dr. Nadia Samagudu from the University of Maryland and the Institute of Human Virology, Nigeria, will be con. We'll ask you um, to open the app so that we can do a pre-vote. And then the way this will run is we'll first have the pro presentation, then the con presentation. We'll have time for questions, and then um, a little bit of time for some responses, and then we'll take another vote. And the individual who's changed most hearts and minds will be the winner. Now, um, I could um, read the, the long list of accomplishments of both of our formidable debaters. I think they're probably well known to everybody in the audience, so I'm not going to read through this, but say they're both movers and shakers, and I think will change your minds. So um, are we voting? Can't see. Is it is it working, folks? We're told that if you exit and re-enter, you'll be it'll work. So, do you agree or disagree with the statement that long-acting and junk? injectable ART will solve adolescent ART problems. How's it going? People voting? Turn, are we going to see the results? Yeah, okay. Do you want to get up in the meantime while we're waiting? Yeah. Okay. Has everybody voted? Okay. Okay. So here we go. Come on, undecided. Guys, uh, swing votes. <laughs> okay, so right now it looks like there are more people who agree. We'll see what happens at at the end. Okay, we'll turn it over to our pro debater. Good morning, everyone. For the long-acting injectable ART will solve adolescent ART adherence problem. When I heard about long-acting ART, I'm thinking about my patients in the clinics. 15-year-old people living with HIV perinatally acquired on TLD viral suppression since five years old. 15-year-old recently acquired HIV for three months, good on TLD viral suppress. I'm worried about them because adherence is dynamic. You, people who already have viral suppress, but they need lifelong treatment. So adherence issue will come at a certain time. And I know that adolescent is a period of dynamic on their life. So they also have adherence issue that I concern every single day. People living with HIV, 18 years old, she just get into first year university. It's a great time if you remember back in your college. 
So he just started to enter the new life and just have struggled with treatment, daily pill. And also have 18 year old, have multi-drug resistant, had low viral load because she take it. But they have drug resistant and she's have very low CD4. She also needs something. We need something new in order to provide to all of this adolescent. So what is the reasons of adherence? Russia have a very nice systematic review of what is the barriers of adherence. There are many, there are difference between adult and adolescent. And you can see that in adolescent, the first reason is forgot. Travel, secrecy, pill burden, that we also need some injectable to solve this issue. And because we are now travel, do you miss your dose? I also miss my uh, statin this morning. <laughs> <laughs> and what is the long-acting drugs that's available? In 2023, there are two long-acting antiretroviral treatments that can be used as long-acting. Carbotecavir, Repivirin, that can be used as intramuscular every four to eight weeks. It was approved for HIV with biological suppressed age above 12 years old and body weight more than 35 kilos. So it's mean that adolescents would be able to use it. And also like lenacopovir subcutaneous every 24 weeks, even though it was used with oral antiretroviral optimized background. But you now have a choice for people living with HIV heavily treated with multi-drug resistant that you really need the regimen in order to make it work. So let's go into the details of how this regimen work. Full regimen of long-acting injectable, cabotecavir with repivirine that we, we heard a lot in this meeting. It was in the US guideline showing that this long-acting of cabotecavir repivirine can be given every one or two months in an optimized option of patients who are engaged in their healthcare, virological suppress on oral therapy for three to six months, who agree to make the frequent clinic visits needed to receive the injectable drugs. You might wonder that if you still need a frequent clinic visits and why you do long acting, because we need integrated care for adolescent. So you can use your time to focus on other quality of life, on the mental health or the quality of life and not need to worry about viral suppression because you know that it's in your hand that uh, adolescent is already viral suppressed. And how about the data? What is the data? The data to support it is come from at last two month study that just recently published that for 152 weeks result, how is the risk of drug resistant? So even for every eight week, the risk of confirmed biological failure is very low, 2.3%. And if you use it every four weeks, it's only 0.4%. Of course, they might have some minimal risk of emergent resistance, but I think it's intelligent risk. If you, re if you compare it with the daily auto pill, you know in your heart that the risk of uh, biological failure in adolescent is much higher than 0.4% or 2.3%. And the good news is that 13 out of <clears throat> 14 participants can be achieved biological resuppression with the PI best regimen or DTG best regimen. And how about painful? The injection side reactions, it will be occur at the first time. Everything that you do it first time, you're nervous. But over the time, it's waning out. And I talked to the patients who already have carbotecovir, but for prevention, because the treatment is not available yet in Thailand. And they say that it's much less painful than benzatine penicillin for syphilis. So I think many of them have experienced injectable from benzatine or even um, contraceptive. Uh, injection and how to deliver wrong acting injectable ART. I think the important thing is that now they also have choice that you can start with lead in oral regimen or you can direct to e injection approach and it can be used in the injection, injection site at the ventral gluteal. So I think the good thing is that you're not confused with the benzatine penicillin because it's also dorsal gluteal. And you need a bridging oral regimen if you miss schedule. Need to restart oral ART within seven days after due date. However, if the bridging less than one month, you not need to go back for reloading. You can continue on. The most important thing is that the pharmacokinetic tail of repivirine is longer than cabotecovir. So you have to make sure that if they will have some bridging, the patients or adolescents need to be informed and well prepared of how to manage the time that they cannot come into the window of seven days. How about the capsid inhibition of lenacopavir? 
if you do business as usual is in the blue line, okay? If you have people who have multi-drug resistant and you don't have new drugs add on on the optimized background, you will see, you will not see any change in viral load over time. However, if you add lenacopavir in the regimen, you can see significant decline of viral reduction by two log by 15 days. And if you can count in another way, 88% of the participants be able to have significant viral load reduction compared to 17% that just do business as usual using social or intervention that motivate people to uh, get more, um, um, be able to have adherence in the usual way. So I think now we have an evidence, scientific evidence, and have a product in hand. Let's move to the second part of the opinion of people in the scientific community and also for the patient's point of view. Uh, this has come from the PADO guideline talking about we need advance in prevention and treatment for HIV children and adolescent. We talk about new technology like a patch or injectable subcutaneous or intramuscular for adolescent, which is in the bottom line, in the bottom of the table. And why we need that? Because overcome adherence challenges for adolescent. But the more, more important is, is that who was on the part of five? It's my esteemed opponent. Thank you for your support that you put it into public that it for overcome adherence challenges for adolescent. Thank you. So let's see what is the point of view of the youth. This is the survey from the interested youth living with HIV with long-acting antiretrovirus from the US. And they show that either intramuscular or implant, they have more than 80% interested to use. And what is the frequency that they are accepted? You can see in the bottom that if it's more, if it's once every month, every two months, or every three months, the accepted is more than 80%. And who needs that? They are both for uh, people who have viral suppression, 57%, 56% that interested. However, a child who have high and detectable virus, 77% they are looking forward to have long acting to help them to be able to achieve viral suppression. And what about Thai people? We have conducted this study with a PENTA group that have a survey in different countries. And the first word that they come in their mind is freedom. No more worry taking pills every day or hiding pills away from the rem reminders of taking pills, which is the reminders every single day that are living with HIV. And what they give the message is that what we need as a youth is for you to provide and educate us, demonstrate us how to use it so we can be more confident when it's available in Thailand. We would like to get advice how to manage side effects. We want to know how to get it delivered to our body. Can it be reduced the pain over time? Can it be convenient to go into clinic and get it? And also, if possible, to have self-injection. And this is the data from the MOCA study, which is the important study that uh, lead to the way that now we get approval for adolescent. And the reasons for uh, taking or participating in the MOCA study is that I hope to take medicine without daily pills. 100% of them said that this is the reason that they want to try long-acting antiretroviral therapy. And also in the in-depth interview, they are the same theme that they don't want to having remember to take pills and avoid stressing to have daily medication. And also the most important things for adolescents is worry about hiding pills from their peers. They want a freedom to live a normal adolescent life. And there is an, uh, will be a data uh, coming out from Sub-Saharan Africa. There are data from the later study that will be enrolled in many countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I'm very looking forward to what the adolescent in Africa will feel about long acting. And the last one is that how to get access to that. Long acting injectable carbotecavir will have generic company to produce it. And in the modeling is that if the long acting injectable every four weeks would cost 120 US dollar per person, would it be cost effective? So in this, in this modeling, they say that if we use it for, in the middle column, if it used for someone who have water load more than 1,000 copy, 
the benefit is not only for that person, but it's also to reduce transmission because of U equal U. So it will be more cost effective if you start with someone who have high viral load. However, if the person who have less than 1,000 copies, it might look like it's not cost effective because it's 2,800 US dollars. But is it because we are low and middle income country that we cannot afford 2,800 US dollar to trade off with the one daily awarded? I think it's just more on how we can push an advocacy to have it available at a, at a cheaper price and be able in the market. Not because we are not afford, but we need to make it available. So I think at the end, I think that you are convinced now that you don't need to think about why, because you are very convinced that it will be solved adolescent adherence problem. But you need to take, think about how and how I can involve with this journey, how we can help each other or generate real world efficacy, how we can address special population, how we push the policy advocate and make sure that we have equitable access. And the last very important piece is how we can go back and then get the voice from youth and know how to make it applicable and available in your settings. Thank you. Well, thank you. I think we're all convinced. Now, <laughs> Dr. Nadia, take the stage, the podium. Talk us out of it. All right. Well, I'd like to thank my esteemed opponent for her points. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> very nice, very nice. Uh, now in Ghana, um, wearing the colors black and red either means you're going to war or you're going to a funeral. So I'll leave it up to you to decide what's <laughs> happening. <here. laughs> so I'm, I'm arguing for the corn and the reality check on the motion of long acting injectable ART will solve adolescent ART adherence problems is that no, they will not. And I'm here to tell you about that. So I'd like us to take a ride into reality town. I have a series of cars there, you can pick one. I like the blue BMW over there, so <laughs> pick your car. So I will start by uh, what I'm not refuting. I am not refuting what my esteemed uh, opponent said. LAART reduces dosing. It reduces the need for remembering and taking daily oral pills. It reduces risk of drug fatigue. It is safe and effective. Adolescents want it and find it highly attractive and acceptable. I'm not arguing that. Thank you. And in that respect, we are best friends forever. So here's my BFF here on this particular set of points. <laughs> but we need to take a ride into reality town, okay? That's all nice, but we need to go. All right. And I'm making my arguments from a population level LMIC viewpoint using data that's available. Knowing that the vast majority of adolescents living with HIV are in low and middle income countries. And I know you appreciate that because you are from Thailand, which is a low and middle income country. And I think given by what you're showing in the picture there, she's even giving me a thumbs up, <laughs> right? Indicating that she does agree with the points that I'm making. So, going into reality town, okay, I'm going to give you a series of fact checks and uh, reality checks uh, from reality town. So, willingness to use LAART decreases with higher injection frequency, okay? From the same paper that you cited some of your data from. We have these uh, 303 uh, adolescents and young people in the U.S., who had not been exposed to LAART, but they were asked what they felt about LAART, okay? And they had a mixture of different levels of um, having a detectable or undetectable virus. And you can see here that we're showing that at the bottom there in red, going from once every week to once every three months, you see a higher level of acceptability with the lower numbers of doses, all right? Therefore, where LAART has been established, willingness to use it will drop if the number of injections increase. And there are reports already coming out of US and other places showing that we had to go from two monthly injections to one month monthly dosing because viral rebound was happening among adolescents who had already been previously suppressed on oral ART and then were started on LAART. So even if it looks attractive and you start at a certain frequency and you start dropping 
uh, increasing the number of doses, you are going to have a decreased level of adherence even to your injectable ART. And by the way, did we mention that LA ART dosing is two gluteal injections per monthly or two monthly dose? That is 12 injections a year or 24 injections a year, depending on your dosing schedule. And no, by the way, gluteal is not in your arm. <laughs> so moving on in reality town, trypanophobia, that's a fancy word. It means uh, excessive fear of needles. And there are other well-known factors that negatively affect acceptability and feasibility, and therefore adherence of early ART among adolescents. So if you don't believe me, I have data too, my dear. Um, and it's also a systematic review and meta-analysis. Um, so <laughs> you will see in this abstract that they looked at data sources like forever and from everybody everywhere, okay? And they're showing that needle fear range from 20 to 50% in adolescents and 20 to 30% in young adults. And in general, needle fear decreased with increasing age. It means that it increases with decreasing age, meaning that our population of interest have a high level of fear of needles. And that is a huge problem in terms of getting things done and coming back for the injections. So they, they concluded that fear of needles is common in patients requiring preventive care and in those undergoing treatment. So please note that, okay? There's a fear of needles and there's a higher prevalence of that among children and adolescents. Now, still in reality town, there are other factors that will negatively affect the use of LART. That is number of clinic visits. And I like how she very slyly went over that and said, well, you know, we can sit in clinic and talk about other things apart from giving you your drugs and whatnot. Yeah, she really tried to get that over. But you know what? When you're looking at LMICs, adolescents don't want to come to clinic that often for any reason, for any reason, and not so much having two shots in your you know where. Um, so we are at a multi-month dispensing of every six months for oral ART. That's really two times a year. Even for some children and younger children or younger adolescents with, with every three-month visits, that's a maximum of four visits a year. So if you're presenting this to a young adolescent, 12 injections in six visits, 24 in 12 versus pick up your oral ART in two visits or in four visits, what do you think they are going to Look at, think about that. Now, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Attractiveness of LAART is low among adolescents who are already suppressed on oral ART. From the same paper that you quoted, my dear opponent, you can see that that schematic is showing you that for those who are on, actually have high detectable loads, they, those are the ones who are more likely to accept LAART and to try and get on that. All right, so adolescents already suppressed are less likely to want to switch to LART. And I'll give you an example from Nigeria. We're actually doing quite well with DTG. And at this point, 85 to 95% of our adolescents in the program that I run and lead are virally suppressed on oral DTG. Why then would they switch to 12 to 24 injections a year in six to 12 clinic visits compared to oral ART in two to four clinic visits? Also, Remember the high number or high proportion of adolescents who have a fear of needles. It is real people. So I have my own data too. When I'm not debating people in different fora, I actually do a little research on the side. <laughs> so there's a concern. And I, and I noted that you said you're looking forward to getting data from African countries in terms of how adolescents feel. I'm giving it to you, my dear. See, it's a concern for feasibility of ART in spite of its attractiveness. At the 2022 Adolescent HIV Workshop in Cape Town, South Africa, which is an African country, there were about 140 attendees, among whom were adolescents and young people, including some very, very strong activists and program implementers, researchers, policymakers. These are the people who make things happen. And about 90% were living or working in Africa, and more than 90% were living or working in LMICs, which is where most adolescents living with HIV can be found. And you can see here, in terms of social ecological model um, arrangement of their feedback, that they, they, they listed a series of issues that they had, that things that they thought would be barriers to LAART implementation. And you can see we are going from procurement issues, delayed approval, centralization of services will be a problem, 
cultural norms, human resources, drug storage, logistics, provider confidence and competence, the frequency of visits, they said it, I didn't, frequency of visits and clinic burden is an issue, and then misinformation that will make people not accept. It's not enough just for it to be attractive. There's a whole bunch of people who have issues with this. And then cross-cutting all of these concerns was the high cost of LAART. Somebody's going to have to pay for that. And we are going from tens or hundreds of dollars a year to thousands of dollars a year. I didn't have to show you that data. My opponent showed you that data. From 1700 to about $2,800 a year. That is a lot of money. So reality check, people. There might be a problem there. And then some of the last words I'm going to leave here are things that my opponent said herself. And I'm quoting her verbatim here. Our lessons are in a vulnerable life stage where forgiving regimens are needed to support them through drug adherence challenges to reduce their risk of developing drug resistance. Some patients stop HIV treatment in an effort to be more similar to their peers or prioritize other aspects of their personal lives over their health. And by the way, a forgiving regimen is one that includes ARVs that have higher barriers to emergent drug resistance, despite occasional poor adherence. Now, integrase inhibitors are forgiving. LAART is not forgiving. We cannot afford occasional poor adherence with LAART because of its long-acting action. There are significant consequences if a patient misses a dose. You have to be dosed with oral ART, she said, oral bridging until you get back on track, and this can get complicated, which we cannot afford in LMICs either. And our lessons on LAART, as I said, will not be able to afford this occasional poor adherence. Missing one clinic visit in two months can result in missing 100% or 50% of the required injections. That's two out of two or two out of four, depending on your dosing schedule. So I want to end there and just say thank you for raising all the points before but we need a reality check. Thank you very much, Lisa. Okay, well, thank you for that reality check. Uh, we are now have about eight minutes for questions. So um, we'll start with questions in the room. We need, let's see, one, two, okay, let's, and I'll ask you to do one question and as simple as possible and direct it to either speaker. Thanks. Um, I'm Jimmy Carlucci. I'm at Indiana University. And um, I have a question that neither of you really directly addressed, which is the issue of uh, drug resistance and to NNRTIs in particular um, and the relative lack of knowledge about drug resistance for any individual, especially in LMICs and whether or not that uh, high prevalence of pretreatment in NRTI resistance is another potential barrier to getting adolescents on um, these long-acting injectables that at least at this point include Rilpivirine. I, I agree that um, drug resistance might be a barrier, especially on an NRTI, but I think we can use the history of how they take medicine. For example, if you have newly diagnosed that's still um, starting with DTG, so it's uh, unlikely that they have uh, an NRTI resistant. So I think it's not mean that everyone will be suitable, so you need a criteria of who will be benefit. But I think the important thing that you have a choice and have an options for adolescent. So I would say choices are great, but if you don't have equitable access to these choices, then there's no point in it being actually a choice, not an actual choice. And me speaking from Nigeria, where I don't know when this is going to be available, at what cost, and how sustainable it's going to be. So I have concerns about for those even that can have access to these drugs, missing one or two doses, and having long-acting, doses of long-acting uh, 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 ARTs in the setting of having and NRTIs that you are you, NRTIs that you're not taking then will become problems with adherence to one or both groups of drugs that you're dealing with. And we also don't have a lot of data on uh, pre-treatment and during treatment resistance. We don't have uh, much less viral load, much less having drug resistance testing. So it's a huge issue in terms of monitoring and knowing where we are going and we don't need to go uh, walk in the dark as far as it's concerned. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for a great debate. Um, none of you have mentioned African study. There is now a published paper by Lona Tusk and her group looking at the interest of South Africa, pretty large cohort young people for hypothetical use of injectables. I wanted to see if you're aware and would you like to comment. And last point is uh, you, none of you mentioned two weeks window for the injections. How do you think it can affect treatment? Because you just have two weeks to give the repeat shot. So I'll start with that. I am aware of uh, uh, the Tosca study, and uh, you know, in interest of time and not giving, trying to give her a little, you know, respite and not bringing all of that in. Uh, but again, first of all, South Africa is an African country, but they have very, very different uh, resources and HIV uh, um, uh, epidemic in South Africa. Nigeria is heavily dependent on PEPFAR. South Africa, and this is coming from a South African a person who works in the ministry, said they use PEPFAR to innovate innovate. And so we cannot take South African data and extrapolate it to Nigeria or to other countries, especially East and Southern Africa versus West and Central Africa. That said, they still in that study, Tosca et al., did bring up concerns about missing doses, concerns about monitoring, concerns about fear of needles. And part of that was making sure that we have enough qualitative data and pre-implementation uh, feasibility studies to make sure that we are going in the right direction. Thank you. Um, in terms of the window of injection that you have, must uh, plus or minus seven days or 14 days to make sure that uh, adolescent coming in and get it on time. I think we need to prepare, prepare both of their education about how to use it and also need to be prepared a healthcare system to make it easy and available. But I think the most important thing is that don't, don't afraid to start a new paradigm. If you're going back to 1996 when we start triple therapy, at that time you have like eight pills three times a day. But if you don't start at that time, you're not going to be at this point that you be happy with TLD once daily once appeal. So I think it's the matter how, of how the program mature and be able to provide uh, care and be able to make it possible. Oh. Hi, Annette So and Triadesia. Thank you. My question is for, for Dr. Sam Magudu, but thanks to both of you for great presentations. So as I was listening to the, the presentations and, and comments, I mean, it sort of occurred to me that even when we talk about dolotegravir for children, we still don't have that in India, which is the country that makes the generic medicines for other countries. But if we didn't start with some countries, we kind of wouldn't see it evolving across the world. So I guess my question for you is that if we say that reality town applies to everyone and we, we, don't, we don't say that it could be the solution, could that end up delaying when the world gets access to these injectables for adolescents? I mean, do you see a, a potential weakness in that approach by, since it doesn't work for one country or another country, we should just close the door on everything? Thank you. So, so thank you for the question. And for me saying, um, you know, we need a reality check doesn't mean that uh, we don't have different realities for different countries. Of course, when we're discussing things like DTG, there were some places that thought we wouldn't be able to afford or wouldn't be able to buy. The thing is that I'm speaking from a population base, basis in countries that are not necessarily Thailand or South Africa, and, I'm, and, and especially in West and Central Africa. And I'm telling you from the program standpoint that this is very difficult to implement. Other countries have already started, right? In the US and other countries, even uh, there are African countries that have approved uh, long-acting ART for uh, PrEP. And I know very soon they'll probably be doing that for, uh, for treatment. But it doesn't mean that other places shouldn't implement. What I'm saying here, and I'll mention it a little bit when I talk again, is that it is something that we need to look at in terms of timing and how well we are going to be able to do it with the information that we have, with the funding that we have. And right now I'm saying that it is not a silver bullet. We've been discussing it in terms of it being a silver bullet. It is not a silver bullet. We need multiple uh, um, ART options and not only LAART and LAART is not gonna solve the problem. Thank you. We have time for one more very brief question. Yes, it's uh, on the reality check too. It's, uh, my experience is when you talk about one injection is okay, when you say the reality is 
both sides is already uh, there is a real drop in uh, in the willingness of the, the adolescent who dreamt that it was a great uh, idea. And I wanted to know what are the studies of how um, it wins off in the time, like uh, what has been published at 48 or 96 weeks in adherence over time in adolescents, what is published so far, and how much they, they, they really maintain the willingness over time. Does adherence wane amongst those? I don't think there are data. She's in the Kate, US. You had one way. last question. Just a quick comment. It, it, maybe both of you could address how do you take a child, an adolescent, out of school every two months for the injection? Is there a need for a different delivery mechanism? And could that potentially be more stigmatizing to be attending clinic? Our, our adolescent clinic is on Friday afternoon and Saturday. We don't necessarily have Saturday afternoon clinics in Nigeria. We can't afford it. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I'm closing the question and answer period. Each of our speakers has two months for two minutes for a rebuttal. Should we start first? Yeah. Let's do it. All right, so a rebuttal from uh, Reality Town. Where is this going to go? I do have a couple of slides. Did you put that up? Can we go back to my slide? Yes. <laughs> so a rebuttal from the Reality Town citizens. Uh, people will say, but Dr. Nadia, you said you're an implementation scientist and LAART is an evidence-based intervention. You should be looking to scale it up. Yes, before you attack me on that, um, I just few things I just want to state. Very simple. Okay? I am not saying LAART is not safe, effective, or attractive. I would think about it myself before I were an adolescent. But I am an implementation scientist, and I examine evidence for implementation in context. For LMICs, LAART's attractiveness and acceptability do not equate and will not necessarily translate into feasibility, affordability, or sustainability. I am saying that LAART is not a silver bullet. It is not the be all and end all. And it is not the be all and end all for addressing treatment adherence among adolescents with HIV. I am saying that given the multiple real world implementation issues, because that's what implementation scientists look at, I have outlined long acting injectable ART will not solve adolescent ART adherence problems, not on its own and especially not in LMICs, including my esteemed opponent's country, where the vast majority of adolescents with HIV live. And really, that is the last word that I would like Reality Town citizens to share with you. Thank you very much. I totally agree with you because you are one of my BFF best friend, that adherence is not be fixed just by the silver bullet of long acting. Can I have my slide, please? Because adherence issue is dynamic over time at the different stage of life, and everyone facing adherence issue, even someone who are currently maintained viral suppression, or one who are working towards achieving viral suppression. But I have different philosophy. You have a philosophy that if it's not broken, don't fix. My philosophy is prevention is better than fixing problem. I'm not complacency, thinking that someone who already suppressed and have good adherence now, it will stay forever. It's dynamic, so we need to have a backup plan. And adherence issue is multifactorial. We need to have a combination of strategy to en enhance adherence. And I think it's quite not fair to put one daily regimen oral drugs on the hand of adolescent. They also need our hand to make it available to have informed choice to have oral drug daily or long acting injectable drugs. And this is the picture that was painted from, the, from our workshop. This is what our adolescent 
would like to convey a message. I'm waiting for a long-acting injectable, even though the road is long or wide, but I'm waiting. And for you, all the audience, the scientists, the researchers, the stakeholders, keep fighting for a long-acting injectable. I like it, long-acting injectable, and I hope that you are convinced and believed to be on the pro side. Thank you. Well, that was fantastic, and I agree with both of you. So <laughs> now we're going to turn back to a vote. Um, open up the voting again, and please, everyone, make a commitment, pro or con. Are you, are there problems again? I'm checking to make sure everybody's voting. So the winner is going to be invited to do the debate next year. <laughs> okay. Are people still voting? Okay, why don't we see where we are? <gasps> oh. Well, it looks like our implementation scientists has changed more hearts and minds. <laughs> Congratulations and thank you very Please much. Please do not to both invite me next year. <laughs> Invite Claire back up and we'll start our abstract session. Thank you.